My name is Abenadar. I'm 42 years of age and in the process of being mustered out of the Imperial Roman Army, where I has, have served well, if with no special distinction, for the past five and 20 years. Rising to the rank of centurion, captain over 100 men, as you can tell by the crest in my helmet, no mean feat for a man such as I, who started his military career not as a nobleman's son with a purchased commission, but dirt poor. I've come up through the ranks the hard way, and I've got the scars on my body, and some would say on my soul, those who believe I'm human enough to have a soul, but I have the scars to prove it. Gaul, Africa, Palestine, you name it. If it's part of the Roman Empire, I've been there, fighting and risking my neck most of the time so that fools like Pilate can sit in their palaces, drink imported wine, and convince themselves that they're heroes as they knowingly condemn innocent men to death. Let me tell you, I expected better of Pilate. He was a soldier at one time, and not a bad one, although he was always ambitious and out for himself more than anything else. But I didn't come here to talk to you about Pontius Pilate today. What I want to talk to you about was one of my last official duties as a Roman centurion, one that I never expected to be involved in and had no desire to be or, or liking for. I had been on peacekeeping duty in this land that the Jews call Israel and we Romans refer to as Palestine, was in what had been the capital, Jerusalem. My career was over. I should have been out and on my way home, but the ship that was bringing the replacement troops wrecked and didn't get here. And we received word that the troops that were coming not only to replace us, but to reinforce the Jerusalem garrison would be late. They were coming to reinforce it because it was the time of the Passover of the Jews, one of their great feasts. And we always bring in extra troops for the Jews' feasts. It's just the prudent thing to do. Now, you need to know, Palestine is no easy place to serve any time. And peacekeeping can be a tough duty. You see, it's not like a battle where you know who the enemy is and who he isn't. Here in this land, you're never quite sure. That grandfatherly-looking Jewish man who just passed you, he may turn and stick a dagger in you if he gets a chance. You don't quite know who to trust. Tensions are always high here. And during Passover, one of the Jews' great religious festivals, nationalist feeling among them runs high. It's understandable in a way. They're looking back, savoring past victories, and at the same time, they're grinding their teeth at being under Roman law. Somehow or other, they have never really quite gotten used to the idea that they are a defeated people and that we, the Romans, are in control now. Although sometimes I wonder how strong our hold is. Because you see, unlike other parts of the empire, where Rome is definitely in control, we have to handle these people with kid gloves, especially during these religious festivals of theirs. That's why I was surprised to find out that we would be crucifying three of them, we, I say, as the Roman army. Uh, that's not my job. But there were to be three of them crucified during this feast of the Passover. And I was especially surprised because one of them was very popular with the people. He was a sort of Robin Hood figure, a freedom fighter of sorts, named Barabbas. He had tried an unsuccessful revolt in which there had been rioting and murder. The legions came in broke up his army, captured him, and now he was to pay the price for it on a Roman cross. I really thought that they would let him stay in jail until after this festival, rather than put the crowd in an ugly mood by crucifying one of its heroes. Someone said that Pilate was afraid 
that, that Barabbas would escape or, or be set free, and with all the nationalist feeling running so high, he was worried that there might be a, a revolt or a, another riot or something to free him, and he thought that a dead hero was better than a live threat. <laughs> anyway, no matter what happened, Pilate didn't have anything to worry about there in the Praetorium, surrounded by his special hand-picked troops. It was my men and I out on the streets who would take the heat. At any rate, I didn't pay much attention to these executions other than to maybe beef up my patrols a bit. Crucifixion wasn't my job. We had a team of specialists here for that. I was here on extended duty as a peacekeeper. I'm not an executioner. No, I've performed executions, of course, as has any centurion who has come up through the ranks. But it's nothing I've a liking for. I am a warrior. It's one thing to face an enemy who is armed and free and dangerous and to best him on the field of battle. Or even, as you gain in rank, to be able to outmaneuver his men with your own. No matter what happens, there's a certain amount of professional pride and dignity there. But to kill a man, bound and helpless, and then to stretch that killing out on a cross is something that's distasteful to me as it is to many warriors. Something I'd rather not be involved in. And I had no plan to be. But I did want to look at this Barabbas character, though, and I thought I'd have it either before or after he was crucified. And then things started moving a little too fast for me. First, Gaulus. He's the centurion who was in charge of the squad of executioners. Gaulus got himself sliced up by one of his own men. He'll live, but I understand that his sword arm has been cut to ribbons. I'm not sure what it was about some drunken brawl over money and a woman I heard, the things soldiers usually fight over. The soldier who did it is in the stockade, and he'll be lucky if he doesn't end up hanging from one of his own crosses. But what happened was that with Gaulus laid up, they drafted the centurion with the most service time for the job. And that was me. As I said, I had my 25 years in in the service of the emperor, and I would have been discharged and going home if that ship had not wrecked. So I had to take over for Gaulus to crucify Barabbas and two of his men, in addition to my regular duties, peacekeeping, which is stressful enough. I was up pretty much day and night. I was laying down resting when one of my men woke me and said that the time of the execution had been moved up. I'd be commanding Gaulus' squad of men who were waiting with one of the prisoners, he said. I got dressed, hurried over to the praetorium, and got the letters of execution from Pilate. And that's when I discovered that I would not be executing Barabbas. His two men were still going to the cross, but somehow or other he had gotten off. We were crucifying a third man, though, Jesus of Nazareth. He was the one Gaulus' men were with when I arrived, and was he a mess? Pilate had apparently had him flogged. That's another job that has a specialist, a man called a lictor. Tell me, did you ever see what one of our Roman professionals can do to a man with a whip? He can literally skin him alive if he so chooses. And this man had done his job well. It's another job I have no taste for. But this man, Jesus, was strong. He was strong physically, and he had a strength of spirit as well. I have seen men faint, die, or go crazy from the scourging. Not this one, though. Anyway, Gaulus' men had this man, Jesus of Nazareth, and they weren't content to simply guard him. They had to make a plaything out of him, maybe taking out their spite that Barabbas had gotten away from him. They had put an old purple robe on him, made a crown out of thorns for him, had given him a reed for a scepter, and were by turns kneeling in front of him and slapping him around. I soon put a stop to that. I may have had to perform executions, but I never liked it, and I would see no man's misery added to any more than necessary. Now, those men of Gaulus didn't like it, but they knew better than to say anything. I wasn't someone like Gaulus, 
some wet-eared pup that they could push around and maybe slice up. I came up through the ranks the hard way, and I could still best any of them in a rough and tumble with the weapon of their choice, and they knew it. My commission was not handed to me on a silver platter for my 18th birthday, like Gallus's was. I always thought that he became an executioner because he didn't have the courage to face a man on the battlefield. And those men of his in that squad were just the sort to run with him. Anyway, I ended their nonsense, sent them to get the supplies we needed and the other two prisoners, and we proceeded on our way. We were heading outside the city of Jerusalem to a place where we had done executions before, a place called Golgotha, or the Skull. As prescribed by Roman law, hail Caesar, we took the long route, supposedly, so that if any new evidence turned up, the procession could be halted and the case retried. If you want to know the truth, I think the real reason, particularly in an occupied country, is so that as many people as possible would see it and would learn the lesson, this is what happens if you mess with Rome. Anyway, off we went, taking the long route, and that is where we ran into trouble. The two men from Barabbas' band were all right. They were fresh out of prison where they had just had a long rest. But the third man, Jesus, he was weak from the flogging and the loss of blood and whatever else he had been through. He fell several times. And then there came a time when he fell under the cross and could not get up. And so, as I could legally do, I reached out with my short centurion spear and tapped a man in the crowd on the flat of the back. He knew what that meant. He was to carry the cross. And I chose well. He was a large, dark man by the name of Simon. And he carried the cross till we got to Golgotha. When we got there, Jesus refused the wine mixed with myrrh that some of the charitable women of Jerusalem come out and always offer as a painkiller to those facing execution. The other two took it. Now, whether it does any good or not, I don't know. But at that stage of the game, it can't do any harm. Once this was over, I signaled my teams, and they proceeded with the crucifixion. They then took the prisoners' possessions, in this case just their clothing, and piled them in front of the crosses. I had an under-officer with the, with the squads guarding the two end crosses. I stayed with the squad at the middle cross, where I could keep an eye on everything, including those other two squads and my officers. They did much as we did. There were three men and the squad leader at each cross and five articles of clothing piled in front of it. You need to know, the prisoner's possessions are one of the perks of being an executioner. In this case, very slim pickings. But we tossed dice for them, anything to distract us from the misery above us and the erosion of your own soul and manhood that always takes place when you watch a helpless man die knowing that you're responsible for it. By the luck of the dice, I ended up with the best article from the man on the middle cross. It was his robe, a garment that I couldn't find a seam in. Now, the men were surprised when I suggested that we dice for the thing. Someone like Gaulus would have just gobbled everything up for himself. That's the way he is. But I believe in treating my men fairly. That's why I stayed with them throughout most of the day. And I was there when that strange darkness came over the land. It began around 12 noon, about three hours after we had, had performed the crucifixions. And it lasted until about three in the afternoon when Jesus, the man on the middle cross, died. I was there throughout that long afternoon, the longest afternoon of my life. And I heard everything that he had to say. And when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, I couldn't help but think that he meant me, too. Me, the Roman centurion who caused his death, following orders, doing a job I had no stomach for, but resulting in his death, nevertheless. 
I was there when he died. And as a professional soldier, I've seen men die before. And I've seen them die in any number of ways, including on a cross. But I never saw a man die like this one. Some have died full of hate, cursing and screaming. Others laughing and jeering at their enemies, daring them to do their worst. Some cowardly afraid, begging for mercy or calling for their mothers. But I have never seen another man die like this one. At one point, he gave what seemed to be a shout of victory, saying, it is finished, just as an athlete would who has crossed the finish line. And then he settled back as if in, onto a pillow or a child into his father's arms and died. At that moment, taking into account everything I had heard before, I began to believe the rumors that this man truly was the Son of God. I left then, more shaken by this event than anything in my life. I heard later that one of my men, one of Gaulus's men actually, stuck him in the side with a spear just to make sure he was dead. I wish he hadn't done that. Yet I know that he was just following orders, and that that forgiveness that Jesus spoke about is available to him too. And now, now I'm hearing rumors that this Jesus has risen from the dead, and he was dead. I saw him die with my own eyes. And as I said, I've seen men die before, and one of Gaulus's men made doubly sure with the spear. But if he's risen from the dead, it proves beyond the shadow of, of a doubt that he is the Son of God just as I thought. And if he is the Son of God, he can ask his Father for whatever he wants, and it will be given to him or done for him, including that forgiveness that he asked for me and for the other soldiers. And if forgiveness is available to us, the very men who crucified him, it has got to be available to anyone else in the world as well. There's a man I need to see, a fellow officer, a brother centurion named Cornelius, as brave a man as I've ever met. We came up through the ranks together, and I've saved his life on occasion as he has saved mine. But Cornelius is a man who has wondered and thought more about God than anyone I've ever met. And he keeps telling me that it's not so much a matter of outward form as it is of the heart and mind. He's stationed somewhere here in Palestine, Israel, if you want to call it that, as part of the Italian cohort. And I must find him and talk with him. Because you see, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, risen from the dead. And if he truly is, I believe that if I search for him, I will find him. And when I find him, my life is his. I've come back here to the cross where we crucified him. I'm going to stay in Palestine now that I've retired from the army. I have to find out more about this Jesus. If I can find him, I will follow him anywhere, even to the ends of the earth. To get that message across to him, that I believe that he is the Son of God, risen from the dead, to let him know that my life is now his, as it is, was once Caesar's. I'm leaving behind implements that if he sees, he will know what they mean. The helm of service and my weapon as a sign that my life is now his to be used in his service. Peace to you all.